Hello, my name is Mark Gill. I'm the uh, director of the Visualization Lab at St. Cloud State University in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and it's my pleasure today to be talking about social virtual reality, specifically social virtual reality as it's used in education. Social virtual reality can be thought of as a collaborative shared multi-user uh, virtual reality environment. It's designed for uh, immersive headsets like the Oculus Quest or the HTC Vive, the Rift. There's a whole host of them out there and more coming out all the time. Unlike other traditional um, 2D remote distributed um, learning uh, platforms, Zoom, Teams, TeamSpeak, whatever, the um, social virtual reality is designed to replace the engagement, the face-to-face -face social engagement, the, be the behavior interaction, the, the, the eye contact, the, the hand and body gestures uh, that you would be missing without actually being in the same room as somebody. Social virtual reality strives to replace that social connection with other people. There's a number of different social virtual reality platforms out there. Uh, in fact, choosing one can be daunting, and depending on your requirements, uh, one may be more preferable to the others. There's a variety of different audiences. Some of them are very open or organi and organic, uh, such as the one that we're using here. This is Altspace VR. Uh, it's very approachable and open. Uh, people can come freely and engage and be part of a community. Other platforms are more close and insular. They're uh, designed for an enterprise or a uh, group of people who have a common reason for coming together. Uh, sometimes those are better depending on the requirements of your engagement, depending on the requirements of what you're trying to present. One platform may present itself as being better than the others. Um, it also depends on how much money you're willing to invest in the environment. And all of these different platforms, uh, they have what's called a sandbox. It's a technical limitation on what kind of content being, can be created. In platforms such as Altspace, we can create uh, very uh, interactive environments, uh, very rich environments, uh, very detailed environments. This uh, space that I'm presenting this from, this is a virtual reality recreation of the Paramount Center for the Performing Arts in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I've been working on it for a different project, and I I thought it would be appropriate for this one as well. But different platforms, they allow different levels of content creation, different levels of interactivity. And once again, it all depends on, on your specific requirements of what you're trying to um, what you're trying to achieve. At SCSU in the Viz Lab, uh, before this pandemic thing, many of our projects uh, involved uh, shared collaborative virtual environments, uh, multiple users sharing headsets in a shared space. Uh, that space was uh, networked together and mapped uh, into a physical space. Since the pandemic, that use case isn't really viable anymore, so the, the focus of a lot of the work that we've been doing has shifted almost entirely towards social virtual reality. Starting in the spring of last year, we actually engaged in many social and virtual, virtual reality uh, events for our campus. We had a graduation ceremony. Uh, several hundred people were able to um, attend virtually and uh, watch the the congratulation message and the festivities of the graduating class for the College of Science and Engineering. We've held job fairs, we've held design competitions, uh, workshops, uh, conferences, almost anything that can be done face-to-face -face in a social environment can be recreated in virtual reality and retain many of the social benefits of that uh, of that normally face-to-face -face engagement the the contacting the the organic conversation the 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 give and take the natural engagement that you get is um, is preserved and maintained in a social virtual virtual reality environment critical to this, however, in maintaining our, our footprint has been using a, a two-dimensional client, a non-VR client, that um, can be used as a camera to capture what's going on in the environment and stream it out to a, um, to a live video audience or record it. Um, these, uh, these 2D clients are, um, are useful for uh, 
spreading the uh, the footprint and broadening the engagement and addressing at least one of the challenges that we're going to be talking about here soon. As an educational tool, social, social virtual reality has proven itself to be an uh, invaluable tool in meeting this new demand. Since the pandemic, a lot of education, almost all of education, has had to find distributed ways of getting the content out to a remote, um, quarantined audience. As such, the demand in the educational community for social virtual reality has skyrocketed over the past year to replace uh, canceled face-to-face -face events and it's demonstrated that there's other benefits than just being able to still go to that workshop that you'd wanted to go to um, you also get the event its benefits of virtual reality from a pedagogical standpoint the um, the benefits of um, from on pedagogy for of virtual reality uh, the research on that has is is um, is becoming fairly well established that virtual reality increases retention cognition understanding um, additionally it allows for users to go on impossible trips to go to places that would not be possible in a traditional classroom setting concepts ideas settings that would not fit or would not be um, accessible suddenly are now, depending on the platform you can create pretty much any kind of content that you want to bring into this setting so it's like it's very much like the magic school bus if you uh, remember that growing up Either you watched it or your kids did. Now the challenges that I've talked about. Social virtual reality still has a long way to go. Oh, virtual reality in general as a technology still has a long way to go. Access is, uh, is, is a critical concern, is a valid concern. Not everybody has a headset. Uh, so what do you do for the people that don't have headsets? You can't buy them headsets. Well, that's where that 2D client comes in. You can use that to at least get the content out to a broader audience, broader than the ones that are actually able to take the most benefit of it. Most of the headsets that are out there require a PC, so there is a cost involved in that, right? And the um, also the level of engagement that you get for a particular platform depends a lot of times on what you're willing to invest in it. Free platforms such as Altspace allow users to create uh, some pretty grand content. However, there's not a lot of interaction that's possible. Uh, assessment is difficult in this environment. I, it's, I can bring in uh, YouTube videos and st uh, still images and all sorts of 3D content that I want, but that content doesn't really do a whole lot aside from being a model that I can manipulate to a certain extent. There's there's difficulty in designing a task that uh, can be assessed to see how well I do that task. As such, it's difficult for me to convey skills in a social virtual reality environment. It's very easy for me to teach about welding, for instance, but it's very difficult for me to teach you to weld in this environment. Those sorts of experiences still sort of live in the standalone experiential uh, virtual reality field. Um, however, I'm a believer that a lot of the challenges that we've talked about are going to be taking care of themselves over the next five years. I like to bring this chart out pretty much every time I talk about this subject. This graph is an overlay of uh, two different infographics. We have Gartner's Tech Hype Cycle, which is that black curve that's uh, sweeping through the graphic, and then the uh, distribution curve that's broken up into different candy colors. That is Roger's Tech Adoption Cycle, and basically the, the black curve shows the level of public perception of a particular technology. The color distribution under the curve shows the number of people who are adopting that technology as time goes along. And pretty much every technology with the possible exception of fire has gone through a similar cycle where as 
a technology comes along, there's not very many people adopting it. Largely, they're innovators. And once they get their hands on it, we get this uh, peak of inflated expectations where we think it's going to be able to do anything. As early adopters get their hands on it, they find out it doesn't. You get the chasm of disillusionment. That's about where VR has been for a long time, is struggling to get out of that chasm of disillusionment. And for early adopters and the early majorities to adopt it and start using it and drive it up the slope of enlightenment onto the plateau of productivity. So that's about where we are, is, is at that steep part of that curve, trying to climb out of the chasm. And what that's going to require is an app of productivity. A lot of people refer to it as an iPhone moment. 2008, the iPhone comes along, was so productive and so innovative that it became the way smartphones sort of look like from now on. Virtual reality, social virtual reality still needs a productive application that people can look at it and wonder, where has this been all my life? And that suddenly becomes the way things are done. I sort of believe that education could be that application that drives virtual reality up into the mainstream. Over the next five years, the market for educational VR is expected to explode. If you look at any of the market watchers or the, the market analysts, the numbers are going to vary. Would they, most people attribute the um, a growth rate of um, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent over the next five years to just the educational market for virtual reality. So we're not talking about gaming, we're not talking about business or training, we're talking about just the educational market growth rate of approximately 50 percent over the next five years equating to about a 10 billion dollar industry. So with that kind of money coming into the market and that kind of peep, that kind of uh, attention being given and the demand rising, additionally, VR engineering jobs are going up as well. 1,400% increase in the number of job postings between 2018 and 2019. I haven't gotten 2020 numbers, but that's a dramatic increase. That's higher than uh, mobile app developers. That's higher than Bitcoin engineers. What that equates to, with all these people going into the marketplace, all this money coming into the marketplace, is that content from an educational standpoint and interactivity from an educational standpoint is going to continue to improve. As an, as an example of that, the new direction that we're taking for the, um, the visualization lab at St. Cloud State University is focusing on a new um, social virtual reality platform, a new new um, direction in social virtual reality that we can use for our own projects and our own means. To address the challenges and the limitations between social virtual reality and its experiential components, we want to divide a uh, design a, a platform that allows the same social VR engagement, the same interaction, the same communication capabilities, but also allow us to track tasked objects and to train skills and test out the assessment of the performance of those skills in this same environment on a collaborative sense. And we believe that that's the direction that a lot of educational software is going to follow, um, especially if uh, distributed content, distributed information is a um, requirement going forward in the future. Even if the pandemic goes away, when the pandemic goes away, we believe that the, uh, the ancillary benefits and the, the, the other benefits of engaging in this environment with these uh, software skills and these um, capabilities is going to be a, um, a valuable educational asset going forward into the future. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention.